Hello! I am back with our Derm 101 series on morphology, looking more in depth at the dermatologic physical exam. Today's topic is on configuration. A quick reminder that if you haven't watched the other videos in the Derm 101 series, it might be helpful to start there. The first one out was the Derm 101 video on the primary lesion, the second one out was on the secondary lesion, and then the third one out was Derm 101 for scale. This fourth one today on configuration, again, is specifically looking at how the primary lesion or how the rash itself might be grouped and how that might change the differential diagnosis, how we think about the possible disease processes that are happening. Just to point out right off the bat, unlike the primary lesion and the secondary lesion, this is a little bit less exact. The configuration is very helpful for us to bring things up and down the differential diagnosis. However, it is not something that you can put all of your weight into. It's just merely a suggestion for perhaps weighting your differential a little bit differently. So there's a whole lot of different descriptors for configuration. The point of this video is more to introduce the concept and why it's important. And so for that reason, I'm not gonna go over all of them, but we're gonna talk about the most common ones. So let's start with one that we probably see the most often, and that is the annular configuration. So when we say something is annular, usually what that means is that it's in rings or circles, and it usually implies that there is some inflammation, some erythema, and that erythema is around the outside edge of that circle. The most common example of this is tinea corporis. It is an annular or round plaque of erythema. There might be some central clearing, but the inflammation, the action of that rash is around the outside of that circle. Remember that in darker skin types, you won't see that inflammation as easily, but you will still see a raised annular plaque with scale. In the prior video about scale, we talked about how the location of the scale being on the leading edge of that annular plaque makes you more likely to think that it's tinea corporis, whereas notice that if it's an annular plaque, but the scale is on the inside, then it could be something like erythema annularis centrifugum. So an annular rash can be multiple things, but certainly tinea corporis is one of the most common examples and a good prototypical thing to use as a way to think about an annular eruption. Very close to annular is something else called polycyclic. So a polycyclic eruption, usually the way I think about it is it's almost like an annular rash, except it's not a complete circle. It breaks off somewhere and it might have a bunch of different arcuate spots that actually come together. A polycyclic rash can be a lot of different things. It could also be tinea, it could also be EAC. A great tip that I was taught is that anything inflammatory can cause annular and polycyclic eruptions. What that means is that psoriasis can be annular, uh, eczematous eruptions can also be annular. Just because it's annular or polycyclic does not necessarily mean it's one thing or another. A serpiginous eruption is a little bit different because it is theoretically a little bit more serpent or snake-like. When I think about a serpiginous eruption, what I'm usually thinking about is something like cutanea larva migrans, which is when a parasite gets into the skin, usually from direct inoculation from like a beach, a sandy area, and so that's when we see that on the feet. Another obvious one is linear. So something that's linear usually implies that it's an outside job. What that means is that something from the outside is causing that line to occur. The human body itself does not tend to make linear things. There's only a few examples where it's an inside out thing that happens. So thinking about things from the outside in, one of the most obvious ones is the Kebner phenomenon. I'll make another video in the future about the Kebner phenomenon, but just for the purposes of today, the point of the Kebner phenomenon is that you might have an auto-inflammatory condition, something like vitiligo or psoriasis, and wherever you scratch, you tend to recreate that auto-inflammatory condition in that area with light epidermal injury. So you might get a line of psoriasis if you yourself have a history of psoriasis and happen to scratch in that area. Another great example is a pseudocutner phenomenon, where perhaps you touched a wart and then you scratch yourself and you're actually inoculating that HPV virus back into your skin. And that's why we call it pseudocutner, because it's not quite a Kebner phenomenon, but it's the same idea that that uh, action of scratching caused something like that to happen. I will say that there are other things that cause linear eruptions. The one that I really think about that's very fascinating is called flagellate erythema. So flagellate erythema is where usually on the back of a patient, you see a lot of inflammatory linear plaques that come up. And this is usually in the context of one of three things, bleomycin, shiitake mushrooms, or dermatomyositis. It's a very specific eruption, a very cool one that when we see as dermatologists, we can almost track back to one of those three triggers. Talking about linear eruptions naturally lends itself to thinking about things that are geometric. 
So when we say things that are geometric, what we mean by that are rashes that are square, rectangular, circular, things that perfectly look like some shape that the human body does not create. The best example of this that we usually see is when we start to see things on our inpatients. A lot of times we might hear about a rash that is a nice square on the chest and often that's in the place of an EKG lead. For you yourself, you might have noticed a geometric eruption if you used a band-aid and you might be allergic to the adhesive. Another great example of where linear and geometric come together is in poison ivy. When patients brush against poison ivy, they tend to get linear or sometimes geometric patterns depending on how that actually came across their skin. And so geometric implies an outside job. All right, next one in the group is herpetiform. So herpetiform obviously just implies that it looks like herpes. But what does that actually mean? That means that a bunch of spots, usually vesicles, are clustered together and they're actually coming together to coalesce. And when we think about something that's herpetiform, it usually means that they're coming together to the point that the border of it starts to look a little scalloped. So when we say something is herpetiform, usually it implies herpes virus. A more generic way to think about it is adjuminate. Adjuminate just means that things are clustered together. This is where we can start to see papules that cluster together or vesicles that cluster together. So I think of adjuminate almost as a more generic way to describe herpetiform, this um, clustering together of the primary lesion. The next one that I'll mention is moving away from just the strict configuration of the lesion, but rather a spread of a lesion. What I'm trying to say is that when we think about something that we say is sporotrichoid, what we imply is that there is something that is moving through the lymphatics. So a sporotrichoid spread or a sporotrichoid pattern usually occurs on the extremities because there's been some type of inoculation that then gets transferred through the lymphatics. Sporotrichosis is what this is named after, and so that's in the differential for anything with sporotrichoid spread. But that said, there are also other infectious things that can be spread in this pattern. We as dermatologists memorize what that limited differential might be, which includes things like Leishmaniasis, Mycobacterium marinum, penicilliosis. There's also non-infectious things that can be spread in a sporotrichoid way. Metastatic melanoma can be spread in that way as well. The last one for this video that I wanted to talk about is one that's a little bit tricky. It's another adjective for the primary lesion, and that is target or targetoid. When we say something is target or targetoid, there actually is a difference between those two different words. If there's a classic target lesion, what we are saying is that it really looks like three zones of color. Outside is red, just inside that is a rim of pale or white, and then just right in the middle is, again, erythematous or red again. I think that the best way to think about that is just comparing that to the logo for the chain target. It's the easiest way to remember it. Whereas targetoid, or an atypical target or targetoid eruption, is instead usually two zones of color. Outside is red and the inside is either pale or sometimes it's dusky in the case of something like Stevens-Johnson. The reason why differentiating between these two types of descriptors is important is because it's critical for us to differentiate between Stevens-Johnson and a very similar eruption called erythema multiforme. Erythema multiforme tends to form typical targets that are papular, whereas Stevens-Johnson tends to form atypical targets that are macular. And so you can imagine that the primary morphology is critical in figuring out whether it's EM, erythema multiforme, or Stevens-Johnson. And that's also important down the line because Stevens-Johnson is life-threatening, whereas EM is really a cause for concern in terms of mortality, but certainly is a cause of concern for morbidity. So that's a quick and short video talking about configuration in the skin exam. So just like before, if you thought this information was helpful, please like the video below. And if you like all this type of information, please consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks again for joining me today in the Derm 101 series. Please leave a comment as well if you have suggestions for future videos that you'd like to see. Take care.